I welcome everybody who is interested in science and today let's talk about memories. So those things link our perception of the past and present. We forget and remember things. But how do we form memories? What are the neurobiological mechanisms that help us to maintain certain memories and erase the others? So having such knowledge may allow us to do a lot of things. But for example, to ameliorate medical condition linked to the memory losses such as Alzheimer's. And today, I'm going to talk about a paper making a significant progress in that direction. I'm going to touch some details, but even if you don't have a prior background, it won't be an issue. If you just listen to what will be said. Also, before we start, you know, sometimes in neuroscience, uh, we do pay a lot of attention on very high studies that had a quite clear and straightforward implication. Uh, like some of the studies that I have also overviewed in this channel. But doing so, we may overlook quite important fundamental research that will later be the foundation of these applied studies and researches. So, what are we gonna do today? Let's, let's step back and check some of such recent fundament, one of such recent fundamental papers that make quite an important contribution to the field of the memory research. Let's go. go! Information between the neurons in the brain is transferred by uh, the mean of electrical signal. And to go from one neuron to another, the signal needs to pass, uh, pass a gap named a synapse. And one of the core processes behind the memory formation is actually changing the strengths of these synapses, or in simply speaking, uh, how effectively the signal or information passes through. So logically, we may um, have two principal effects, potentiation or depression, simply speaking, when connection gets stronger or weaker. Uh, scientifically speaking, uh, those processes are named long-term potentiation and long-term depression. Then, for example, if you've learned something new, the brain connection related to such action knowledge will be strengthened potentiation. And if you forget something, it means that the corresponding connection was weakened, depressed. Makes sense. Of course, it's a simplified picture, but enough to get the general idea at this stage. Actually, it wasn't that hard. One of the type of long-term potentiation, so-called NMDA-dependent, was the subject of one of the most cited neuroscience papers, which I have reviewed in the other videos, so look at it if you're interested in more details. But in a nutshell, once we have enough changes in the electrical charge of the cell membrane, it will activate previously blocked NMDA receptors. NMDA is an abbreviation, which will lead to this unblocking of NMDA receptors will lead to the influx of multiple ions, including calcium. The, the influx of calcium will trigger the cascade, the intracellular cascade, that will lead to the recruitment of more receptors of the other type, the AMPA, to the postsynaptic site. And these newly recruited AMPA receptors will further facilitate the sex strengthening of the signal transmission, making it more effective, and this is why we have long-term potentiation. Of course, there are many other molecules included in the process that we do not touch now. Still, the problem even with uh, this more complex picture is the following. These molecules responsible for such connectivity changes are so-called short-lived, uh, lived, uh, meaning that they last only for hours to days, whereas we know that the memories can easily last for years and decades. So how is it even possible? The answer to that question was recently uh, found and published in the journal Science Advances by the international group of researchers led by the scientists from New York, the US. So, as an inspiration, scientists went back. And it's not the bad idea sometimes to review what, we, what kind of ideas we had before. So, uh, the scientists went back to the ideas proposed um, quite a while ago, specifically in 1984 by Francis Crick, the same guy who co-discovered the double helix of the DNA, actually. So, specifically, Francis Crick pointed that it's most likely not um, the individual proteins, but rather an interaction between them that maintain the above described uh, changes of the synaptic strength. Uh, strength. How can it work then? So, how is it, how, what will be the mechanism? Imagine uh, we have molecules A and B and the interaction, connection between them. The idea is the following. The presence of this uh, interaction will launch, so to say, a positive feedback loop. In our case, it means that new molecules A and B will be synthesized by a cell and replace the existing old ones. Therefore, lifespans of individual A and B molecules can be short, but the connection between them that will pass from one identical pair to another and so on and so forth can be long. 
and this is the concept suggested by the researchers to be the mechanism of LTP maintenance in the synapses. Okay, now the concept is more or less clear, I hope, and then let's take a look on a bit more specifically what are those molecules in the as one molecule, we have a specific kinase named PMZ. Okay, let's see what do this, stands, this fancy word stands for. First, by the term kinase, we refer to a specific molecule that do help to transfer a specific chemical, phosphate, from a donor to a substrate molecule. Scientifically speaking, this process is named phosphorylation, and kinases are kind of helpers to maintain this process. This phosphorylation process can uh, be viewed, then, uh, as a tag, uh, and can, this tag can serve multiple functions. For instance, increase or decrease the activity of the substrate, stabilize the substrate, or mark it to the destruction. In our case, PMZ helps to maintain an increased number of AMPA receptors. They call that we, uh, upon the LTP, we have the uh, recruitment of these additional AMPA receptors that help to strengthen the synaptic connection. So, PMZ helps to maintain this increased number of AMPA receptors at the postsynaptic site and therefore strengthening the synaptic transmission. So, PMZ is kind of a support for these additional receptors. However, it's not that straightforward. To physically reach these AMPA receptors and to stay with them, PMZ needs help. And here we have another molecule, which is a protein named Kibra. We don't, we're not going to talk about what this abbreviation stands for. And this protein is a, a postsynaptic scaffolding molecule and by forming a stable complex with PM theta, it helps to maintain uh, PM theta at this, together with this AMPA receptor and therefore support these additionally formed AMPA receptors. Potentially, you know, we could finish here uh, because the main message was delivered. But I wonder what, what I want to do is to share a few additional details because uh, otherwise, those papers will still remain as certain abstractions, such as, okay, scientists have the hypothesis, here's the hypothesis, it is correct, plus a few fancy images, that's it. But, I mean, such high level of abstractions are not bad, we need them, because we can't always go to the methods, details, results, uh, especially, um, you know, when we have so many scientific papers published every day. But, in certain cases, especially to kind of um, train our brain to analyze information. By the way, we, I had another video related to that. Um, if you want, check it out. So, to kind of train our brain to analyze information and to kind of verify, we, we can do and to do this additional um, check of the details of the paper. And I also think it gives us a bit more, so to say, a flavor of science, because in science experiments, we do not have this diagram as outputs. Usually, the outputs are, you know, grayscale pictures, if you're talking about some microscope images, for example, or a huge array of numbers. And then we bring them together and, so to say, simplify and put in the form of a diagram. So, to get this sense and flavor of science, let's now, knowing the results, check out how these results were achieved. Okay, first researchers wanted to prove that those complexes between PMZ and Kibra do occur during LTP, long-term potentiation. So how can they do this? So they need, they need to, you know, kind of see those complexes. But how? You can say through the microscope, kind of. At first researchers prepared, so to say, hippocampal slices. So practically for this, what you do, you euthanize the living mouse and very quickly remove the hippocampus and slice it. So literally, you have to slice uh, through the living tissue. And of course, uh, to maintain in living conditions, you use certain buffer solutions, multiple of them. But then the researchers put the electrodes on the slice, so you have a slice of a living tissue then, you put the electrodes on the slice to, you know, to make an electrical stimulation, to simulate what is going on in our brain. As said, when we think we produce electrical signals, so similar things were done here, but in, but in a controlled conditions on slices. Then, uh, by doing so, very specific electrical sim stimulation of specific uh, connections in the slices, you induce LTP, so sort of sort of a memory, in your slice. And then you take this slice, sort of fix it, so it's not live anymore and use the methods to stain the certain complexes in that slice. In our case, it's Kibra and PIMZ. 
And how you stain them? You stain them with the dye. So you kind of bring them through the solutions where the dyes bind to these complexes. And finally, you will be able to see those complexes through the microscope. Then you analyze that picture and detect the specific increase in the, or decrease of the brightness of the signal in the specific part of that picture. And then you say, aha, now I know that the complex is formed. Again, it is simplified over you because, of course, you need to do statistics, uh, a dif different control conditions, verify that these changes are caused by your intervention, etc. But the general idea is this one. So thus, here researchers did detect the presence of Kibra PMZ complexes in a specific region of stimulated hippocampal slices. Cool. I mean, it's really cool. That felt good. Not good. Brilliant. Also, one one lyric so to say, um, off top. For example, now we just looked on one specific picture, a couple of them actually, and it's important to keep in mind that behind those pictures, it's a, those, there are dozens of hours of work of, of usually students actually, and sometimes even the whole master thesis of a student can go straight to the supplementary of the paper or maybe even be a part of one specific figure. So even though we rushed through this part of the results and discussed them probably in a couple of minutes, at the end, those results are already, it's a concentrate of a huge number of working hours of, uh, of students, uh, principal investigators, professors as well. So yeah, that's, uh, even though it may look quite straight and simple, uh, it's, it's actually not. Then there was another experiment with the slices, where scientists, again, they used living hippocampal slices, applied electrical stimulation, but now they blocked Hebra binding site on PMZ with an inhibitor named Zeta stat, thus not allowing to form this complex, and then they see whether this potentiation is formed or not, and no, it was not formed. But then, okay, slices are cool, interesting approach, but what about living mice? At the end, one can always argue that, okay, this whole process may differ in the living organs, it's, it's, it is a valid point. Therefore, at the next stage, researchers um, first uh, trained mice on a specific memory-related task. Well, in simple words, they put animals in a chamber when, uh, where, when entered in a certain zone, the animal received an electrical shock. Mild, but still unpleasant. Well, in fact, you know, like in this real experiment, uh, this chamber is, is rotating and animals need to use cues to form a spatial memory. And if you're wrong, it's not just, oh, you know, you should, you should study more hard, think about it. No, it's like 0 0.2, 0 0.3 milliamp shocks. Welcome. No, not that easy if you think about it. Well, then animal uh, learned to avoid this zone after some you know, after some trial time. But then one day later, researchers injected the inhibitor, Zetastat, and guess what? The animal forgot it, lost the memories. But interestingly, they lost the memories um, of this task, but they could relearn. The, uh, that was explicitly tested as well. So, the Zetastat persistently disrupt previously acquired information, but once eliminated, doesn't impair formation, maintenance, or expression of newly acquired spatial information. Additionally, scientists repeated similar experiments, but now using another type of inhibitor to block not Kibra binding site in PMZ, but other way around, PMZ anchoring site in Kibra, kind of a complementary experiment. So to additionally prove that it is connections that play a role. And you know, they get the similar results at the end. Yeah, we, we, we do say that, okay, they do the complementary experiments and block other way around the PIM Zeta Ancre site in Kibra. They got similar results, and this is just two, three sentences in a paper. But in fact, if they could not do this complementary experiment, the whole paper would be destroyed. Even that simple sentence at the very end that they done experiment other way around and found the similar results, it's a key point without and without this point the scientists could not go further or at least could not go further with the same hypothesis of course there were other controls and details we have not touched but the key is that the final diagram that we discussed uh, at the beginning was based on scientific data that can be tried by an independent research group maybe your group if you're uh, a scientist and hopefully reproduced 
There is a key difference to some fake science, such as Flat Earth Society or Astrology. They do have fancy pictures, maybe even fancier uh, and better looking than the science papers, but unfortunately, that's all. So, thanks for staying till the end, and if you like this video, give it a thumb up and share it, and if you have any comments, suggestions, or constructive criticism, you are highly welcome in the comment section below, and I hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.